I'm Lynn Smiles and welcome to the Michigan History Nightmares video series part two. Today we're going to be talking about volume two which contains two books, book three which is Entombed in a Hopeful Burial Mound and book four A Shocking Encounter with the Iroquois and Three Fires Native American Tribes. Now before we get into the story, um, if you weren't with me the first during the first video, I sent everybody a special invisible Michigan pen and I sent through cyberspace. So if you didn't get yours, and it's going to be important to have one, I'm going to send it to you now. So at the count of three, grab it. One, two, three. There you go. Good job. Okay. And what I'd like to do before I actually get into the story is I'd like to have you click your pen and we're going to talk a little bit about the Hopewell Mounds, burial mounds, which you can find on the west side of our state. And information I thought was kind of interesting is that the Hopewell people, if you were uh, an important person in the tribe, you were buried with your bodies intact, like you're seeing in this picture, sometimes lying down, sometimes sitting up, sometimes standing in single file. Now, if you were not as important, your body was cremated and then a small hut was built on top of you and then that would be covered with dirt to create a mound. And it was found with the artifacts um, inside the burial mounds that the Hopewell people did travel in trade throughout the United States. I thought that information was quite interesting. Okay, um, let's get into the story then. And if you remember in the last book, the trailer, Katie, had this nightmare that she was buried inside a Hopewell burial mound in a wild animal. Maybe a wolf was trying to get to her. So brace yourself. You're about to join Katie and the group in their next Michigan history nightmare. The new student. After the class settled in their seats, Mrs. Ojobo announced that they had a new student. The young man's name was Zachary Churchill and he was an exchange student from London, England. The class was curious and anxious to meet Zach. The girls giggled, wondering if he'd be cute. Questions popped up as they chatted amongst themselves. Did he have an accent? Did he live in a castle? Had he ever seen the queen? Gary raised his hand. He had just finished reading a book titled Midnight. The story's about a boy our age, he explained, who lives in London, England, and he can transform into a wolf. Well, this comment caused an eruption of conversation. Many of the children in the class had also read the book and they also wanted to share their opinions. Not Katie, though. She sat quietly in her seat, remembering her most recent dream of being buried alive and the threat of being mauled by what possibly could be a wolf. And now with all this talk about a boy from London transforming into a wolf, could Zach possibly be? Now in the afternoon, Mrs. Ojibwa decided she was going to expand the group, so she placed Zach and Helena in Katie's group. Now neither Zach or Helena knew about the computer travel or about the Michigan pen. So then the kids were pulled through the computer and found themselves at the uh, foot of the Hobo burial mounds. Unbelievable was the only word that escaped Zach's lips as he ran his fingers through his hair and slowly slid down the trunk of a nearby tree. Now, previously, Katie had shared her nightmare with Helena. So Helena looked directly at Katie and in a quivering voice that was no more than a whisper asked, is this what I think it is? Is this part of the dream you had yesterday? How did we get here? And how will we get back to school? Just as Katie was about to answer, a menacing growl ripped through the air. The terrifying snarl seemed to come from behind some strange mounds in the distance. There were about 30 mounds in all. Everyone was pretty shaken and no one spoke for a long time. The only sounds were the breeze as it rustled through the trees and the soft rippling of the water as it splashed against the shore. As they approached the burial mounds, they heard a strange, muffled groan. Could this place be haunted? Were the spirits angry that the children were trespassing on sacred land? Too frightened to run, run the small group froze in place. They looked like four statues standing guard at the foot of the tallest mound. Goosebumps covered their bodies. Zach was the first to break his statue-like pose. He turned to speak to Gary, but Gary was gone. Zach called out, Gary, old chap, where are you? This is a one bit funny. Where did you go? There was no reply. Only silence. Hmm, I wonder what happens to Katie. Do you think she'll find herself inside the burial mound? Where's Gary? 
And what about the wolf? So we're going to go on to um, book four now. And this chapter is called War Cries. Before any questions could be asked or answered, the war cries began. Ear splitting screeches, hollers, and yelps permeated the air and echoed through the forest. The fog cleared, but the five children did not find themselves safe to the cloud. And they certainly were not in London. They were in a thick forest near a huge lake. Elmbark homes called wigwams, which looked like upside down bowls down at the landscape. They needed to find somewhere to hide so they wouldn't be spotted and captured. There was no time for discussion. Everyone took off in different directions. Katie ran to hide behind a nearby home, narrowly escaping a group of warriors as they charged by. She breathed a sigh of relief. She was safe for now. Then she felt a small hand clamp over her mouth. Now, the group finally reunites and they're saved by two Ottawa children. So as you're reading this chapter, you'll find out about the uh, lives of the Three Fires Native American tribes. Next chapter, this is no dream. Night sounds danced on the cool breeze. Owls howled, hooted, hoo, hoo, almost of asking, who are these strange visitors sleeping in the cave below? Insects sang their own songs, communicating with each other through the velvety darkness. Suddenly, the peaceful evening melody was shattered. A piercing howl ripped through the air. All five children bolted upright from their makeshift beds. Katie looked for Zach. She could barely make out his features in the dark, but she could tell it was him. He was right where he had been when they all went to sleep. Then everyone turned and gave Gary a glaring look. No, it wasn't me this time, honest, he said. It was probably a coyote or maybe a wolf. Anyway, let's try to get some shut eye. We have a big day ahead of us tomorrow. Once again, the exhausted explorers gave in to their weariness and fell into a sound sleep. The children slept so soundly they didn't hear the approaching footsteps until it was too late. Each child was snatched up and carried out of the cave. Totally dazed and trying to clear their heads from the fog of sleep, they heard a strange, unrecognizable language as their captors carried them off into the woods. It was odd that they could understand the Ottawa children, but not the adults. But then, sometimes children were seemed to be able to communicate with one another better than with grown-ups. One word the kids did recognize was Pugwajis. This meant the elders had found them. Maybe that was who had been lurking around the cave earlier. Now what? No one had ever said what the tribe did when they captured Pugwajis. They traveled deeper into the woods. Click your pens. All seem lost. Then a savage growl echoed through the forest. The dreadful sound seemed to be coming from all around them. The air crackled with the power and danger as the wild animal drew so close they could smell its breath. The men froze, dropped the struggling children to the ground, and fled. The, the children waited in horror for the wild beast to attack, but all they heard was something running away. A quick escape, but to where? Nick broke the silence. Helena, click the pen now, he yelled, running up to her. Maybe it will work this time. We have to get out of here. Wait, Katie cried as she looked around to make sure the group was all together. Gary was in sight, but where was Zach? Just at that moment, Zach came running from the direction of the village to join the group. Helena, click the pen. Silence, tingle, burr. Well, obviously this isn't home, Gary's teeth chattered as he trudged through knee-high mounds of snow. Okay, Katie, what was your dream this time? Just once could you have a dream? Emphasis on the word dream here, not nightmare, where we are in some historical place and we are warm, not starving and not fearing for our lives. Sorry, guys, I did have a glimpse of our next saga, but it was interrupted when we were captured. All I know is that we're going to be cold and hungry, Katie replied. When the children saw a wigwam in the distance, Hoping to find food and a warm place to stay, they continued trying with all their strength to plod through the snow. Because the snow was so deep, it was almost impossible to move forward. Soon the five explorers collapsed in a heap on the impassable snow banks. Hey, Helena, where's the pen? Nick asked, shivering from the bitter cold. Click, click the pen. Even if it doesn't get us back to school, at least it might get us someplace warm. Click your pens. Helena's fingers were so numb that she barely had enough movement in them to press the tiny silver plunger on the top of the pen. Sorry guys, the pen seems to be frozen. Maybe we could just rest here 
until we get a second wind, she suggested as she curled up into a ball to keep warm. The idea was to rest for just a few minutes, any longer they would freeze. Eyes closed, sleep overcame the brave group. Helena still had the Michigan pen in her hand. As her eyes closed, the pen slipped from the, her fingers and was lost in the snow. Okay, now we're going to, I'm going to be reading a trailer for the next book. So I'm going to have you click your pens. A Frightful Ocean Voyage. The intense storm triggered a deluge of water that swept over the creaking wooden deck. Lightning, like jagged tire, tiger claws, seemed to rip open the menacing black sky. Repeated explosions of thunder shook the ship down to its timbers. The sailing vessel was tossed about like a toy boat in a kid's swimming pool. Huge waves crashed over the bow. Loud, urgent voices shouted out orders in what sounded like the children's French language teacher's accent. Pierre Jacques Marquette, shouts could be heard above the roar of the storm. Helena and the others clung tightly to their bunks, hoping the ship could survive this intense, violent storm. So did you notice the, uh, the, the flag at the top of this ship? Hmm. Okay, please click your pens. And here we have, um, and it's some ideas for um, the Hopo Berry Mounds, and this would be to make your own Hopo Berry Mound cake, and also paper plate dream catchers. Now, you can find these links posted on my website, lynnsmiles.com. Also, uh, again, you can find a description of the books and merchandise that supports the stories. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. And what do you think about Zach? Do you think he can transform into a wolf? And please share this video with someone you think would like to take this wild journey with Katie and the gang. So let's pan over to volume three, which is book five. And this one is the Michigan Fur Trade, a hair-raising adventure. So I hope you enjoyed today's journey with Katie and the gang. Are you ready to be captured by pirates? Until next time, goodbye and sweet dreams.